Hey everybody, it's Matt Michaels here on the DeFalco Files with the owner and creator of FSW, the future stars of wrestling here in Las Vegas, Mr. Joe DeFalco. And Joe, how are you doing tonight? Oh, tremendous. And uh, we got with us a little uh, special surprise for you in uh, the heart and soulless tag team, Nick Xander and Chase Bell. Gentlemen, how you guys doing? Hey, how's it going? You know, we're doing good. Me and Chase Bell coming off a big weekend, you know, a little yeah. pissed off right now, but uh, I'll let Chase speak it for a second. How you feeling, Chase? Oh, man, I'm feeling good, man. I mean, we didn't really do what we promised to do last weekend for the Tag Team Championships, but we got in front of a huge crowd, made a big statement, and created a moment that nobody's going to forget. That's right. And this is where DeFalco uh, speaks up and says, wait, what, what, what happened this weekend? <laughs> Proving that one person forgot. Football <laughs> happened this weekend. You know what I mean? You had the big Peyton and Eli yes. Monday night football today, brother. Some bad beats. Thank God Dallas won. I had some uh, teasers going. But I got, I got brutalized yesterday in some of those games. Jeez. Yeah, it, it was a shit show. Like, literally it was just so bad yesterday um and amazingly enough out of 29 teams in our survivor pool only one person got eliminated i was i was going like this is the weekend this is great i'm gonna be in good position nope, nope. don't talk about eliminations this early with me and chase man come on it's too early <laughs> well speaking of eliminations uh joe let's talk a little bit uh about this past uh friday show um, survival of the fittest uh, went off with uh, pretty spectacular results uh, all around. Um, what were your feelings uh, after you've gotten time to kind of step back and, and think about it for a little bit? You know, overall, I think uh, it went well. You know, I would have liked to have more people there, but we had a good turnout, not a great turnout. And you know, maybe we're spoiled, but I was expecting more people to come out, being that it's, you know, a show away from the FSW arena. But right. I didn't realize till like four days before the show, it was NASCAR weekend, and they had a big race Friday night. And I know a lot of our people, you know, if that was the reason, I'm not sure, but a good amount of our regulars who make just about every show you know, didn't make this one, you know, people say, yeah, and there was UFC and the Raider game. It's like, well, yeah, that's Saturday and Sunday. It has nothing to do you know, with Friday night. And, you know, again, it went pretty smooth. You know, we, we started a few minutes late, but we still, you know, got the show done before 10 o'clock. So that was a good thing, you know, trying to keep that flow going. And, you know, definitely some, uh, you know, some good work done, you know, getting a guy like Sam Adonis in. Everybody seems to be uh, big fans of his, and we're kind of talking and see if we can make him, uh, you know, more of a regular. Yeah, I think that um, Sam, you know, really, man, um, in that main event, uh, talk about three big men in one ring it was really cool to uh see that kind of uh fsw heavyweight tradition going off in the main event and at one point juicy got whipped so hard into the corner that the i thought your ring was gone man that ring just shifted so hard and i thought it was that was it for uh the fsw ring but it was it was a spectacular main event um what did you think about the um the performance in that main event as compared to some of the rest of the show where you had uh, guys like uh chase and nick who did some really spectacular work in terms of um some good high spots some really nice moments um do you think that that's that's the balance that most wrestling fans are looking for is to see some of that spectacular high flying stuff but to also see the ground and pound and some of that killer heavyweight stuff as well you know you got to have a little bit of everything if you have too much of the same thing then, then it becomes boring it doesn't matter if it's the same thing of just heavyweights beating each other down 
or just lightweights flying all over the place. It's like, you know, as great as the talent is of like a PWG, like I, I kind of get bored because it's a lot of the similar stuff. Every match goes 25 minutes. There's 37, you know, false finishes and, and it gets tiresome after a while. And, you know, the main thing I try to do when I put together a show is trying to break things up. You know, we had two elimination matches and in between that we had the last man standing match. Yeah. We had a, a four way with, with Remy and the battle of the sexes and, you know, thrown in there, the return of Damian Drake and, you know, going to tag, you know, it's, it's about trying to get the guys who've worked hard and have earned a spot. You know, it's it's not always easy to get a lot of people on those bigger shows because we're 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 limiting what we normally do. But Survival of the Fittest is one of those shows, kind of like the Against All Odds Rumble. Like you know, we're gonna have 25, 30 guys in that match, and you know, everybody needs to understand when we're doing an anniversary show. Yeah, we might have the Battle Royal, but there's some shows that are just strictly going to be eight or nine matches and you got two tag teams and you got a women's match and you got a four way. And then you got, you know, three guys defending their title. You know, it's hard for guys like sky high and heart and soulless and swap a seat those to maybe get spots on there. So when you can get them on, you try to reward the guys who've worked hard and try to get them in there. You know, Nick and Chase, I want you guys to kind of chime in on that, um, that idea of what it means for you guys at such a, a early stage, essentially, of you guys tagging. If you look at the longevity, you know, you guys haven't been tagging that long in comparison to a Sky High or, or Suavecitos. Um, what does it mean for you guys to be given an opportunity to be on a bigger show like this? Um, this will be like a two-parter, I guess I'll start and then hand it over to Chase, but being a part of a big casino show or even just the FSW show in general means so much to me because Joe puts over all the time. I used to be the guy buying tickets from him. You know what I mean? Being in the front row, cheering on the Damian Drakes, the Remy's whirlwind gentlemen at the time, you know what I mean? So to be on a show with those guys to share the ring, to share that experience of all those, all of our great fans, you know what I mean? Who, who pay good money. And especially like Joe saying, like on a big weekend, how it was the people that were there, you just kind of have to soak it all in, but at the same time, go out there and give the best performance you can because yes, spots are limited. So you got to do the most with what you have there. Ain't that right, Chase? Yeah. I mean, FSW was, Real and was literally the reason why I moved from New Orleans all the way to Vegas was that like I wanted to be with the best place with the best school and like to be given like the opportunity for the tag team championship it just feels like the past year I've been here was like being told that thank you for the work you've been putting in here's here's a chance to really make something big with yourself and so for that yeah thank you and, and you took advantage of that. Um, you know, both of you guys did some um, pretty solid and, and a, a couple kind of crazy spots, especially because there was no guardrail. Yeah. It was amazing that you guys hit your marks without, you know, really going into the crowd. Uh, what was that feel for you guys because of the fact that you know, uh, usually the guardrails are in place, uh, whether it be the FSW arena or on uh, outside shows. Um, was it a little different in terms of how you have to calculate what you're doing and how much you're relying on the, you know, the two or three people that are going to catch you guys? Um, is is it that, that kind of committing to that trust and uh, just, you know, also kind of hoping that it doesn't end up where your legs go flying into someone's face. Oh God. Yeah. Um, at least for, I can only speak for myself, but with the guardrails, like being there for normal shows, there's always just the, in the back of your mind, if you do a dive, if you go a little too far, your legs are smacking that rail. 
at least I knew for this show, like there was like a rarely good distance between the ring and for the crowd. So I know a worst case scenario, even if I don't, you know, manage to hit, like, you know, get caught and land on the guys, at least if I hit like the ground, I still don't hit any fans. Right. Yeah. And that's well, a huge point. Hits, that's a or if he hits George Furman, he knows he's got a good cushion. <laughs> yeah, George will got George got us. George got us. You know, I think that's another thing, man. Uh for these big shows, you have to do stuff you don't usually do. And for me, that's something you wouldn't normally see me do because at the end of the day, the work rate in the ring will outshine whatever that big move is or whatever uh, caution you're going to throw um, for me. That's just my opinion. You know what I mean? So to have that opportunity on a big stage, you know, you kind of have to fill that whole canvas that Joe lays out for you. You know what I mean? If you feel a little bit, you know, you don't know the next guy might feel a little bit more. And then that's that guy's spot the next time. So being cautious with, like I mentioned, the great fans we have and trying to fill the canvas, it was uh, something a little different for me. When I was up there on the top rope, one of the come alongs was loose. So I thought it was going to give in under me. Uh, so we would have seen the extreme rules finish before it happened uh, on Friday, <laughs> if that was the case. Um, Joe, when you look at putting together a um, a tag gauntlet, what is your main objective in terms of how you are going about telling that story to get to that final spot where you have the tag belts uh, finally being defended in that last uh, length of the gauntlet? Well, with the, with the unguided being injured and the bone and the RMB kind of not being around, it was like, well, who's going to wrestle death proof for the tag titles? And the remaining teams have all been kind of going back and forth and back and forth. So it's like there was neat, not one of those three teams stood out above the other. They were all kind of in that, that same place between Sky High, Heart and Soulless, you know, and the Suavecitos. And despite the Suavecitos getting that title shot the show before, you know, they had a really good effort. So they, they've been right there back and forth with everybody. So I felt, you know, especially being survival of the fittest, you know, a gauntlet to take the teams to death proof, whoever got through the, those three teams is deserving of the shot. But it also doesn't hurt a sky high, for example, because they had a hard part spot with the Suavecitos and then had to go in not as fresh against one of the best tag teams, you know, around. So, you know, there's no shame in, in them losing at that point. But you're also not going to have a random gauntlet and penalize the tag team champions. So they kind of have to go at the end just to... You know, I like it to be fair and realistic, most importantly. I want people to believe that, oh, okay, you know, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it should be, you know. And, you know, with four teams, it was enough. We didn't want to go too many just because we had a lot going on and we had two elimination matches. And Remy was under the impression his match was going to be an elimination match. And, you know, the battle of the sexes, and it was like, well, we can't go four and a half hours. So, you know, the stuff with the faction and then the stuff with Hammerstone and MK, they were the two matches deserving. And then, of course, Jay Vidal and Gregory Sharp, you know, they were worthy of having, you know, a very long match. You know, they've had a killer feud. And, you know, Greg Sharp, you know, he, he's without a doubt, you know, as good as he's been for 10 years, you know, he has really put himself in the spotlight. And I'm going to take credit for that because he was mad at me. And realistically, you know, he felt that he wasn't getting, you know, the recognition or he was being overlooked, which, you know, when you can count on somebody like that and he's a solid guy, you know, it is possible that that happened when I look back at it, you know but he really stepped it up and, and he proved he deserves to be in the mix when we're talking about all these great talent 
that we have in the, uh, you know, mainly in the no limits. And, and now those guys, they can go after the Nevada state title too. That's right. And um, for anyone who hasn't seen, you can actually get the replay on fight TV for 1499. Um, but there is a new Nevada state champion. Um, the Suavecito is an Adrian quest beat down of Remy was so well timed and very well done because I think the fans really felt that, you know, this was kind of like, you know, they were just kind of upset that there was a beat down that just happened. And then classes music hit and he teased it so beautifully, like he's done in the past, like he might cash it in. And then when he cashed it in and hit that pin, I, I thought, I thought some of your fans were going to walk out. It just felt like there was that much heat on him. Did it go the way you thought you saw it going in your mind with this being the opportunity time to cash it in? Yeah, the, the, the only issue I had with, with that with class was I felt he took a lot of time to get to the ring. It was like, as an opportunist, you know, he should have been right there because that, that was his best opportunity. And, you know, you don't want to give your opponent too much time or you don't want the perception of this guy's gotten way too much time. So, you know, I went back and I told him, I'm like, bro, you don't need to be chatting with the Suavecitos. You know, you can do that after after you win. You know, Remy's already laid out. Take advantage of that situation. But, you know, other than that, you know, it got the reaction I expected it to. Class has quickly become a guy that people don't like. And, you know, there's a lot of guys when they're trying to be heels, you know, they're still trying to be cool. And we've been fortunate that, you know, a guy like Brett the Threat, a guy like Class, a guy like the Suavecitos, they've been out and they're not looking, you know, for the fans, you know, adulation. You know, the Suavecitos tried that early on. And when they were working as baby faces, nobody gave a shit and they, they, they booed the hell out of them anyway. So now at least they have a, a real reason to dislike those guys. You know, you mentioned Brett the Threat, and I saw Xander almost throw up. Um, so, Nick, what is your take on, you know, the rivalry between the two of you guys in terms of, you know, starting fairly close to the same time? And why is it that Brett rubs you in such a wrong manner? Uh. First of all, Matt, I just find it very disrespectful. You got to talk about Brett the Threat while I'm on the podcast. But, you know, there's no Xander talk when he's on because he never closes his mouth. You know what I mean? Right now, Chase Bell and my focus is on Suavecitos. You know what I mean? Because think about what happened. We could have been facing Death Proof in that finals instead of Sky High. And Sky High, you know, they gave up their good fight, but they squandered that opportunity that rightfully probably should have been ours you know if it wasn't for ricky gomez clapping me right in the nuts with his foot you know what i mean we probably would have been out there to help remy marcel remy marcel could be the nevada state champion right now if it wasn't for that i was getting medical attention and chase bell was right by my side when it happened now well, no matt, matt matt now that we're on the topic of breath of threat though let's talk about everything Brett the Threat has done, right? Brett the Threat's been on the Survival of the Fittest pre-show, and then after he worked, he watched the door and sold tickets like he always teases me while I was in the Tag Team Championship gauntlet, while I went to Best of the West this Saturday, while I was working on Sunday, he probably was out doing Uber Eats, collecting his little $15. That way he could pay for his little dip in his mouth. So if you want to talk about a rivalry, I don't really see one. You know what I mean? But if you want to throw it out in the air, I guess so. But he needs to worry about Bodie Morgan and not Nick Xander. You know, Joe, when you when you look at this um, class of, you know, young guys who are Chase and Nick and Brett, what is it about these guys 
that is kind of setting them apart from some of the other classes that you've had over the years is it just the determination that all of these guys are showing um is it the hunger and the passion for you know wanting to succeed uh and is that giving you something that you're able to you know put yourself almost in a a good position but a bad position too because you have guys who are ready for these shots when maybe some of the other guys who have you know been around a little longer might get a little of that jealous bug because these guys are taking full advantage of opportunity well every every year there there's always that group of guys that kind of and girls that kind of step up a little bit and they they all have the same reason for where they're at and it's called work ethic you know you're not going to get good sitting at home you know these guys put in the hours you know chase came in you know he's got a little more experience than, than the rest of them but he came in and it was like i liked what i saw from from the very beginning you know that's why on the first show that Chase was available that we put him on, I wanted to see where he was at. And he wrestled Ice Williams in his first match in FSW. Unfortunately, it was kind of a shitty match. But immediately after that, you kind of said, oh, okay, well, well, maybe Chase isn't as good as I thought he was. But then he put in the time and he got other opportunities. And every time he went out there, he got better and better. And he was always improving. So it's easy to say that that was an anomaly and Hey, it's his first match in, maybe he's nervous. They didn't click whatever it was, but what now you have a bigger, a bigger idea of his work. And now you can look at that resume and, you know, he's put together some good matches. Now he's had a, had a couple of clunky ones in there in, in between, but he works hard. You know, he's gotten the crowd behind him very quickly. You know, as we well know, that that's that's the hardest thing to do is to get people to care about you. And, you know, surprisingly to me, you know, Nick and Chase initially were kind of this makeshift team uh, because we, we kind of needed another face tag team. And Nick was over with the crowd. Chase was over with the crowd. Hey, let's put them together. They can work some matches and we see where it goes, but they seem to have good success. They seem to have, you know, they were able to, to have some good teamwork together. And it was like, you know, it just kind of evolved to where now they, they kind of got some gear instead of, you know, individual stuff. And I remember Nick asking me, and honestly, at that time, I really had no idea what we were doing. My goal was trying to get X amount of matches. And I felt Nick and Chase deserved to get matches. But if we, if we had them in the singles division, then they may not have got as much work because that would have been two more matches that would have had to been added to the card. So there's a good chance that, you know, half of the shows they work, they might not have worked on. So keeping them as a tag, especially since they were, they were working well together and they were improving, you know, that's all you can ask from somebody and, you know, getting a response from the crowd, you know, everybody can see it. So you have to take advantage of those situations. Chase, what is, what has it been like for you having taken a leap of faith by moving to Las Vegas to take advantage of fsw and what it has to offer what was your mindset when you came out here and how has it lived up to your expectations or has it exceeded your ex expectations and is it something where you are looking at your self knowing that you can do this um and just kind of having to you know kind of find yourself in a new city and just kind of make your mark over the last year. Oh, well, I guess first thing I can say is like, when I, when I moved here, and like I said before, the reason was like, 
I want to be the best. So I want, I need to learn from the best. And with FSW, like when you walk in the building, they show you the wall right there, like the flags, their hall of fame. And it's like the resume checks out. So it's like, yeah, it was like a real big leap to pretty much leave home right after college, leave my friends, leave my family, leave every single thing I knew behind to go across the country, pretty much just by myself, just, just to have an interview over there. Cause Joe could have easily said no first day to me. And so it's like, when you like put all your eggs in that basket, for a lot of people, yeah, it's scary, it's terrifying, but for me, it, for what I wanted, for what I want for myself, it was a no-brainer. How has it been for you and Nick coming together in terms of, not only in the ring, but in terms of building a friendship that allows you guys to be on the same page while you're working together? Uh, I'll admit, like, at first uh, trial runs, it was it was a bit clunky, and it just it took a while to just knock the chinks out for us to, like, really get each other as people, but also get each other at, like, as wrestlers in the ring. So instead of trying to, I guess, trying to make things work, it's more of, like, what do I bring to the table? What do you bring to the table? And how can we use both of those to make the best out of each other? And it, it took some months, it took some time, but as you can clearly see from our last few matches, we've been, we've been making it work. Nick, have you been able to start picking up on that? Um, I guess it's kind of like a third eye when tag teams start being able to kind of know exactly what you guys are going to do without even having to really, you know, talk to each other. Has that started to happen for you guys? I think me and Chase have this thing where we give each other the look every now and then, and we kind of get it. Um, but just having the luxury of probably the best, like, pure athlete in Las Vegas or on the West Coast, you know, to tag in and out with, uh, I, think, I, I think a lot of people could be jealous. A lot of people, you know, could want that. And I have that. Um, and he has probably the best professional wrestler one year and under. And those things only happen because we're under the FSW banner. You know what I mean? Coaches, Sin Bodhi, Cutthroat Cody, Remy Marcel, uh, Kenny King, D'Lo Brown, uh, even special guest coaches um, helped us out tremendously um, making this formula work. You know, we're two kind of separate people, you know, Chase is his own type of person you know I can't really speak for him but you know he kind of has this like dark side to him right and he has uh a lot of things that I don't and I have a lot of things that he doesn't you know what I mean but you know that's why we're kind of heart and soulless you know we we just make how Chase said we just make the best of what each other are and um going off what you were saying about do we have this kind of uh, uh quiet communication or whatever I think we're starting to develop it um, are we a master in it? No, because if we did, we'd be FSW tag team champions right now. But right now we're just working that out and uh, got our sights, uh, our sights set on making that happen whenever we can. You know, Joe, you have high octane coming up here on uh, Saturday, October 9th. Um, and you just made an announcement of a big tag team championship match where the unguided uh, get a chance to regain the championships they had to give up when Damian Durant got injured from death proof. Um, when you look at a team like unguided and Matt and Brett have, or Damian have um, really just had that infusion of their friendship kind of grow that team to be what they they've become. Do you see kind of similarities in what Nick and Chase are doing, um, you know, in terms of that growth, obviously not at the same level because, you know, Matt and Damien have been, you know, working a little longer, but can you see that potential of Nick and Chase hitting a level where they're 
work will not only transcend inside the ring, but also outside of the ring as well to where they have a brotherhood. Maybe down the line, but that has to do with them. Hopefully they like each other and they can spend time with each other. We've had a lot of tag teams that we've put together that failed miserably. That was a good idea, but they weren't, they weren't together. You know, they were still two individuals, a lot of people that really had their hearts set on being a singles wrestler and didn't put the work in to be tag team. You know, the reason why the 1% became so successful was two guys who would drive in separately from SoCal now started working out together. They started driving together and they formed a bond and it really helped them. And that, and that's what the bottom line is. You know, Damian Drake and Matt Vandergriff were doing their own thing. They were doing the singles thing. And uh, at the Conan AAA tryout, I put them together in the match because I felt those guys had the best opportunity to maybe get signed. And if they get looked at in a match together, which they did, and it worked out. But Matt Vandergriff ended up moving from California to Vegas because A, FSW, and, you know, and 1A was Damian Drake. They became really good friends. So putting them together, you know, kind of transcended. Damian Drake had just gotten off being the No Limits champion. You know, he had, he had a tag team title run with Spider back in the day, you know. So right now, guys like Nick and Chase, they're so early in their career, they need to focus more on improving and getting better. While Matt and Damian Drake were, all, were already very, very good, the question became, will they be able to gel as a tag team? And they have. And as noticed, as successful as Damian Drake was as a singles wrestler, with Damian Drake being out, man, Matt Vandegrift has killed it, you know, for the last four months. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how that dynamic works again on October 9th because that was supposed to be the, the, the main, one of the main matches at the uh, night two of the anniversary show. And, you know, unfortunately, we didn't get to see it then, but I'm really looking forward to it on October 9th. You know, we're trying to put together a, a great card for the aftermath of Survival of the Fist. When you look at Matt's... Um you know, growth as a singles wrestler as well. Um, this week, you know, he wasn't at the, uh, the show because he was out on the East Coast. Do you feel that when the guys get the opportunity and they start taking the ball and running with it, how reflective is that for you to start getting those fans who might not be familiar with FSW to see someone like a Mac Vandergriff in person or Jay Vidal has been doing the same thing as well, going out to, you know, Chicago and, and other places. Does that, you know, solidify the fact that, you know, how damn talented these guys are, you know, how damn talented the company is that it will draw more eyes and potentially, you know, get more people tuning in either to the FSW network or to, you know, buy a pay-per-view um, to check out some of the guys that now people, you know, a couple thousand miles away are finally getting a chance to see live in person. Well, that's been what the growth of FSW has been, always having these talented guys, one through the other, and the Crosses and the Bays and, and Lacey Ryan and Sefa. But it's also those guys like Matt Vandegrift who now – travels all over and works GCW pretty regularly. And the more we have guys who can get out there, Jay Vidal's doing a lot of that now. Also, he's getting a lot of recognition, getting seen in a bigger platform. You know, where do they come from? Oh, FSW. Oh, yeah, I kind of heard about that. Or I have heard about that. And everybody who goes out there, you know, you go, you go to Phoenix – and go see any time one of their companies is running a show and, you know, half the roster is FSW guys. You know, you go to Best of the West, Mike Rain uses a lot of our guys now, you know. Oh, and why does he do that? Because he likes them? No, because they're the most talented guys. 
They're the ones who are going out looking for work. And he knows that these guys are going to come in and they're going to perform at a high level. And, you know, there's a lot of good talent out there. So there's got to be something special about our guys when they get spots over guys from California when they're doing a show in California. You know, they don't need to pay the extra to get a Vegas guy in. But if they feel a Vegas guy is better, you know, they'll throw him a few extra bucks and they'll get him out there. And, you know, that's how these guys are going to improve. You know, I talk about, you know, the other companies around town and it's like, you know, that's great for guys. They want to get experience and all the other stuff. But in reality, their growth is going to be because they went to California, because they, they went to Arizona, because they went to Utah, you know, wrestling down the street. And, you know, you know that that doesn't help you. It's the same fan base. Go go look at the front row of the other shows. You know, right. the ones that are there are, are, are the fans that we cultivated, you know, We've been doing it for 12 years. So when you go look and you see the chief and you see, you know, Brandy and you see all them, they never came to local wrestling until they heard of FSW. And then seeing our guys working elsewhere, because there are guys, most of them were trained through us. Most of them got their name in Vegas through us. So when they post on social media that, hey, we got a show Saturday night. Well, FSW doesn't. I'm not going to discourage guys from getting work. So they're going to go out there and they're going to perform. You know, sometimes I don't really like the situations they're put in. And, you know, I try to, I try to explain to them the value of taking a good booking compared to just a booking. Yep. Um, and speaking of something like that, Nick, you just had an experience with um, best in the West what was that like for you? And um, do you do you understand what Joe is saying when he talks about that idea of, um, you know, a good booking versus something that might be a little more detrimental to, you know, uh, what you're actually doing at FSW? Uh, absolutely. Um, I'll touch on the latter first because I feel like it's very important for a lot of the young talent and talent at FSW or whatever the case may be to understand is that your value decreases when you could be seen at a show and grab a lemonade afterwards or uh, a backyard or whatever the case. Then all of a sudden they don't got to pay the money to go to FSW to see you. You know what I mean? Right. So to have that kind of uh, loyalty to FSW means a lot because not only is that showing that you are sort of kind of keeping that loyalty, it also increases the value of the show that you put your heart out into because I'll tell you, I lift every board. I set up that ring every single time. Do I set up the ring anywhere else? No. Because I love FSW. FSW is giving me everything and more, more than I could ever ask for. So to ask if I understand, absolutely. Because do I want them to pay $20, $25, sometimes $40, maybe for a front row, like a big show at Diversion to see me? Yes. They could go to the backyard and see me for free. Is that right? I don't think so. So yes, I do understand that. And what it means to travel out and go to Best of the West and that kind of experience, Mike Rain has been nothing but good to me. Um, and a part of that is because of FSW. It just all somehow comes back around. Uh, wise Guy needed a match at a future shock. And Joe seeing I was improving and trusting me to kind of go out there and do my job. You know what I mean? And me and Wise Guy had a pretty decent match. And after the match, you know, you normally see wise guy and he's kind of like looking and he gives some critiques or whatever. And he came and he hugged me, said it was one of the one of the coolest things ever. Can't wait to do it again. And he's real tight with Mike Rain. So, you know, that's kind of how these things happen. You know, Steven Tresario came in one time for a training session, had a practice match with him. So between those two guys, that's how I get to navigate those waters over at Best of the West. I wasn't even booked for the show. I wasn't promised any money. 
I went out there because I love it because I want to. And he knows that. And so I was helping out a little bit and he goes, Hey, I need you in one of our main events. It's going to be you versus Steven Tresario versus Jordan Cruz versus class. And to be in there with the caliber of guys like that is just crazy because Joe said, that's where you're going to get that experience. That's how you're going to get better. You know, like I mentioned, you could go to a place and wrestle a guy in a, a jumpsuit with vans on and buy a lemonade after, and that could be all cool or whatever, I, I guess. But the real experience is to be in those guys who have been in for four years, five years, six years, uh, 10 plus years, you know what I mean? So it was a real fun experience and we killed it. You know, it was a big venue and a great experience. And like I say, none of that happens without FSW. Chase, when you think about some of your early matches, at what point did you start feeling that it was starting to click for you that you, you know, were feeling more comfortable getting out of your head a little bit more? Was there a match that sticks out to you as kind of your first turning point in essentially getting it? Uh, for FSW, I guess, um, it just kind of things just kind of just clicked like a few months ago. It's just that I was just in my head too much when I'm in the ring. I like more like thinking too much, trying to keep up with the pace. And it's just that wrestling just stopped being fun for me as hard as that is to say. And it was just more of like, and I think it came to a point where I realized that I knew that I wasn't being myself as a performer, as a wrestler. And it's just like, and it just came to a point where it just clicked in my head. It's like, it can, a match can be like, it can go perfect. It can go awry. But at the end of the day, if I'm going out there, I at least want to have fun doing what I'm doing. And the people out there should be having fun seeing me do what I do. And since I just kind of just put my own enjoyment and my own abilities uh, first, it just kind of started clicking. And then I've been able to have better chemistry with my partner nick and with our opponents when we get in the ring joe can you see while you're on commentary let's say can you see when let's say they wrestled a future shock and then three weeks later they wrestle on a high octane can you see the development of them while you're actually calling the matches Always, you know, you, you're sitting there watching and you're hoping to see the improvement. You know, I'm more of a guy that I'm, lo I'm looking to see when they make mistakes and how they, how they react to it. You know, when you're a younger guy, it's a lot easier to, to screw things up. You know what I mean? And it's like, that's what's going to happen to everybody. You know, I've tried to explain, I've told people, you know, I've watched Brian Cage wrestle Kenny King and it was a shit fest. I've seen Sean Rick or LA Knight, you know, have a miserable match in FSW. And the, the, the guys have been doing it forever. It's not always going to work out for you, but it's the way that you react. And, you know, that's why a lot of times I yap at, you know, Danny from the Suavecitos. You know, when things go wrong, a lot of times, unfortunately, you know, he's a guy that is, you know, and again, it's, it's great to be passionate and, and all that other all other stuff. But, you know, it's a combination of things for why things screw up and you can't go back and start yelling and screaming at the other guy because something didn't go wrong because I'm pretty sure there was plenty of times that the match sucked because he fucked up and having an Adrian quest there for him really kind of settles him down a little bit because I know quest and we joke and, and talk all the time, but Adrian quest is a guy who's been doing this for a long time. And I think he's helped ground the Suavecitos a little bit. You know, Danny's still gonna, he's still that little, you know, that, that, that kid who, who's going to get crazy. He's going to get emotional, but it's like trying to keep things in check. And that's what he needs to do. Talented dude, but he's young and he's prone to making just as many mistakes as somebody else. 
you know, don't be calling people out, discuss it, see why things went wrong and just improve upon it. It's a lot easier when you're not pissed off to try to rework things and make things look good. You know, when you're mad, you're going to overreact, things are going to happen, and it's going to take a match that was struggling and really turn it into a shit fest. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, Nick and Chase, one of the things that I think really impressed me um, this uh, past week was the promo that you guys were able to put together. Um, How has it been for you guys in terms of developing that chemistry on the mic or in this case, you know, in front of the camera at least? Um, Are you guys finding a more comfortability with what your characters are in terms of being able to translate that to the intensity that you guys are giving off now in promos? Um, I think we stopped relying on characters really and just started being ourselves. You know, the heartbeat is sort of a, a character or a moniker, but it's definitely truthfully real life. You know what I mean? The heartbeat of professional wrestling, heartbeat of FSW, whatever you want to call it. It just kind of like who I am, you know? And for Chase, you know what I mean? He, he touched on it. You know, he wanted to be something. And he just kind of started relying on him. And I'll be honest with you, when we first got paired, you know, just like Chase said, I kind of really wasn't happy about it because I felt like I was catching steam. But that's just being young and naive and not really knowing uh, the real deal. You know what I mean? Because you kind of get in your own head about where you think you're at and where you're really at. And finally maturing in the business uh, as quickly as we are, I think you start to realize that. And as far as promo goes, like I mentioned, our chemistry really wasn't there. And did I trust Chase? Did he trust me? No and no. But as we start to develop a trust with each other, we kind of let each other those leashes go. And you're seeing this chemistry grow. And, you know, Chase could tell you right now, you know what I mean? That promo was really, really good. It's probably our best one yet. And that's just because we let each other flow, right? Definitely. Um, I can say truthfully that before FSW, I don't think I was in a single tag team match. So <laughs> I was very used to just being my own guy, being on my own, talking for myself and not really relying on anybody else. So when me and Nick were paired off, it took a lot of us working together, but also took a lot for me to uh find um, to like finally let go of having to put everything on myself and being able to trust another person like that in the ring and actually be able to share that chemistry with each other and make each other better joe um you know speaking of that promo and uh you also kind of mentioned him uh, a little bit earlier and tagging with damian drake and that's spider um you know, Tommy has done a lot of stuff for you guys production wise recently. And this was basically his swan song for a while. What has he meant to you over the years from going from a wrestler to being someone who's learned um, a lot from Joey as well um, in, in terms of becoming really good with his eye for what promos should look like, what, editing should look like what the pacing of things should look like is he someone that you ever thought would be doing something like this after he stopped wrestling not really but early on he used to come by and he used to kind of help out a little bit with the production so what he was capable of doing i don't know uh but when i met him he was this 14 year old kid and you know for anybody who doesn't know spider has asperger's and you know with that you know he came in oh i'm gonna be the next john cena and it's like oh ben and he couldn't do roles and he couldn't do anything and it was just like oh boy and then it turned out after talking to spider uh, his dad who i became good friends with was was a guy who was involved with a lot of people at crazy horse too so we kind of had that bond, which made me probably 
uh, take Spider a little bit more under my wing and pay attention to what he was doing, uh, you know, just because of dad. And, you know, later on, once he started clicking in at the kids class, I remember Remy and a couple of others, you know, you know, got a liking to him. And by the time he was probably 16, we were having him in the regular class, you know, and, you know, he got to go to China and, you know, he got to experience some big things early on in, in his life and career and then kind of took a step back, back and, you know, everybody's got to do what they feel, you know, is best for them. And then he got involved. And then when Joey decided he needed a break, you know, Spider kind of stepped in, but at that point, Spider was doing, you know, a lot of the switching and stuff. And in some cases, you know, Joey was leading the production and Spider would do the stuff, but, but Joey would kind of, you know, hit the spots for him and, hey, switch the camera two, switch the camera three, which in reality is the best way to do it. It's a little harder when you're the one guy there and you got to do it. But with Joey yeah. take the step aside, you know, I heard Spider's got a new gig going on. So we haven't really talked about everything that's going on, but we've been lucky, you know, you know, Ben has been a major asset in that case, you know, not as a referee, but as, as a production guy, you know, he did a lot of stuff. For, he's done a lot of stuff and continues to, you know, and you got Mikey who works and, and, and I try to make things a little easier on guys because because of what our budget is and what we can really afford, you know, I don't want to try to take advantage of situations and have my stuff. So I kind of step up a little bit and, you know, the, like the flyer uh, we just put out with Matt and the unguided. Now we're using the templates of the high octane and future shock. We don't really need to change that around. You know, that's what the show is. But when we come to the big show, a guy like Mikey puts together the video packages. And that takes a lot of time and effort. You know, we don't need to emphasize that on the FSW arena shows as much unless we got something like FSW GCW going on. And we know it's going to be a, a pretty big deal. So, you know, Spider kind of came along at the right time. And I'm going to assume that Joey stepped back because he felt Spider was capable of handling it because uh, I'm pretty sure Joey wouldn't have just stepped aside and let us, you know, crash and burn because then I wouldn't let him do Glory Pro Rising, the uh, hottest new promotion in uh, the West Coast. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and Joey will let you know that. Um... Yes, yes. <laughs> Joint shows. Joint shows all over. Well, you know, speaking of joint shows, and you brought up Mikey's name, I know Mikey has been doing a lot of uh, camera work in Chicago and uh, building a very uh, good, you know, establishment and, and relationship with uh, a lot of the up and coming people out of Chicago. Does that also lead you to potentially consider down the road, um, you know, having that door open where maybe you can work with uh, one of the companies out of Chicago or, you know, if uh, let's say someone goes to Florida and is working with, uh, you know, the companies in Florida, like Remy has or Maserati has, do those relationships also potentially open up a door for you to potentially work with some of these people down the line, um, especially if it, becomes an opportunity like a WrestleMania weekend or something in that kind of big setting? Well, absolutely. You know, we're always looking, but again, it has to make sense. You know, we can't go to Pittsburgh and run a joint show and expect people to come because FSW is there, you know, GCW has got a really good fan base. So they travel all over the place. So for them to come to Vegas where we're king, you know, makes a lot of sense. Now we've talked with companies like WAC and Defy and, you know, numerous others and even, you know, Dom down in Phoenix with, you know, their main guys are Hammerstone, Graves, Gallo and Dom and class. So it, it's not very hard for us to go down there and do something 
as long as they kind of set up an idea of FSW coming in and then doing a joint show there at least makes a lot of sense because, you know, I know they used Cody at the last show and they used Jacob Austin Young and they'll use Remy Marcel and they'll use Gregory Sharp. So again, they use more guys from Vegas than they do from Phoenix. So, you know, it makes sense to me, but, you know, it has to make sense to them. You know, a lot of these companies, they want to do their own thing. And I'm going to be very particular also. You know, we ended up doing a show SummerSlam weekend that I really didn't have much interest in doing. Well, uh, when we did the show on the, on the Sunday, we already had the women's show. We had the FSW GCW show and it got really convoluted with the whole doing with the no piece on Sunday, you know, still waiting for that production money you can count it any minute, you know, that, that, that worked out real well. And the bottom line was the communication was shit. And I thought one thing I thought the other, it, it was kind of spelled out. And I won't make that mistake again. You know, Joey worked with them with the Glory Pro and Palais Pro and, you know, and them and no peace. And, you know, everything went well there. But the communication with me was miserable, you know, and I tried to explain things and it just didn't seem to, you know, always seep in. So it's like, you know, I got to be with people I trust. And because in this business, you can't trust a lot of people. So, you know, I, I've tried to make, you know, friends with people that in real life I want to be friends with, you know, and it's like, you know, sometimes it's a little difficult. Everybody's looking out for themselves. You know, GCW has been great because that came across a lot different than I thought. I thought it was going to be more of a joint thing. Well, Brett kind of gave me the reins to do whatever I wanted on that show. You know, he kind of put together like, hey, these are my guys. This is what you got going. And contrary to popular belief, you know, the only match that Brett put together was Effie and Disco Inferno. But I got kind of laced on Twitter for like, oh, well, he's in he was insistent. Like, how the fuck do these people like have any idea what my thought process was for Disco Inferno? A... That dude hasn't been training with us for like three years. We haven't used him in like two years. But the thought was, hey, we're going to have, as I pro I promoted the idea to him, we were initially going to do Jay Vidal versus Effie. He works the gay brunch and all the other stuff. And we were going to have Disco Inferno do a lava lounge. We felt it would be great. Do it with Ricky Morton of the Rock and Roll Express because Ricky was working the show on the Friday. Well, it turned out he had another show Saturday, so he couldn't make the show in North Carolina. So when we were putting together the idea for the match, Brett was like, well, what about Disco? I'm like, well, I figured we would do Effie. But he's like, oh, you know, I think uh, Disco and Effie, you know, would be way better. And he was 100% right because there was not, we never had more likes than that announcement. And we, we never had more comments that hated Disco than that post. And then when they came out, Disco, you know, he railed Effie. The crowd was, was heated, wanted to see Effie kill him. And Effie cut a promo that even afterwards, Disco Inferno was like, wow, I didn't realize this guy could get such a good promo. You know, and, and it worked out well. And everything else was kind of like, Hey, my idea for was Sandra Moon and, and, and Alley Catch and, and Cody was dying to do Nick Gage. And, you know, Brett was like, well, Nick's working the night before, blah, blah, blah. He'd rather do a tag. So we kind of came up with who better to team with Cody than his biggest rival and probably the guy who is the only guy who might be more hardcore than Cody, which was Funny Bone. So, you know, that was a magical show, you know, Everything was sold out. Couldn't sell another ticket. You know, when GCW comes back out, whether it's in six months or a year, there's no doubt we're going to, you know, work together again. Um, Nick, let me ask you, um, you 
said that, of course, you started as a fan at FSW. At that time, when you were going to FSW shows, who was your favorite wrestler? Man, I don't, I don't want to put nobody on a high horse or anything, but um, honestly, I, I took a liking to Damian Drake. Um, it's, it's cool because I get to see him every day and stuff. And uh, he was just one of those guys who young guys would look up to, right? Because you could look at him and be like, that could be me. He's a no-limits champion. He's doing all, uh, all the crazy stuff that you like to see. Um, he has that kind of young man charisma about him that just connected because that's kind of where I was and kind of the age bracket I was in, you know? Um, a lot of people would say maybe it might be Rocky T, but no, no, it was definitely Damian Drake. Um, his match with Funny Bone at the Mecca Five, or I, I believe it was Mecca Five. Um, five. Was one of my favorite matches of all time at FSW. I mean, just the energy in that arena. And for me, it was match of the night. And you had guys like uh, Bay on that card. And, you know, you had the Lacey versus Taya. And uh, I don't know, ever since then, that was the match that kind of, really made Damian Drake at the top of that pedestal for me and uh, still kind of waiting on that match. You know, me and Chase Bell wrestled them. That was actually me and Chase Bell's first match as a tag team uh, uh -huh. was the unguided. And uh, unfortunately I got put to the door, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, one hell of an experience nonetheless to be in there with like a Damian Drake. So Damian Drake would be my answer for sure. And Chase, you know, obviously you said you, you came here because you knew about FSW. You knew that it was the place to train. How did you first find out about FSW, man? Funny uh, story about Nick talking about Damien Drake. Um, he's the exact same reason I found out about FSW. Uh, I met him a couple, of, you know, about a couple of years back in a New Japan LA dojo. They had a little camp for the week and that is exactly where I met Damian Drake and it was funny because that weekend he was actually having his first show over at AAA so that's pretty much when we started talking he started talking about that and we just kind of just hit it off and he said like if you ever find yourself in Vegas hit up FSW look them up tell them like I sent you and well ended up moving to Vegas Joe, do you uh, give finders fees for uh, Vandergriff and uh, Damien? Because it seems like almost everyone comes through them who come from out of town. Nah, I gave them way more than uh, than needing to give them a, a finders fee. You know, there you go. I should be getting the finders fee. I'm the one who got them to AAA, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, as we kind of wrap up here, um, let me ask you guys uh, each – is there, you know, in your short time being around Joe, is there anything that sticks out in your guys' mind? Um, either something that Joe, you know, does that is uh, amusing to you guys or uh, anything that sticks out in your mind, uh, either story-wise or anything about Joe that, uh, and, and don't worry, he won't, uh, he won't, you know, he won't downgrade you because you, you, uh, <laughs> you, you throw the dirt at him. Okay, I'll let Chase start this one. No, 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 no. <laughs> you first, Nick. You first. Nick, Nick probably has uh, just think there a lot when I'm in the office and I'm busting balls on people. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna defer on uh, exposing Joe to the fullest, but you know, it's just kind of like that that charisma he has about him is very infectious you know he makes you very comfortable around him you know the uh oh, you know this guy nick he'll never be on the defalco files why, why the hell would i ever have to be on there you know yeah that, <laughs> and that this wasn't my choice he so, said, you know. uh, he'll never <laughs> I, trust me i know trust me i know <laughs> you know i wanted somebody with charisma like marcus but, anderson uh, you know so um but yeah <laughs> um, anyway it's, it's just uh, his infectious charisma definitely uh, flows around FSW for sure. And the way he gives opportunity to talent like me and Chase, uh, give him platforms. I mean, he even gave me my first booking in Utah, you know. So 
just the way he takes care of us, you know, uh, some people might have a different opinion, but uh, uh, if one of the good, def he'll definitely take care of you the way he's supposed to. I just think him being around as often as, you know, of uh, promoters, you know, they kind of let guys take care of things and he's very hands on. And that's kind of my approach when it comes to training or a ring crew. So that's what I mean by his like infectious charisma and personality. It kind of trickles down, if you will. So, Chase. Oh, man. Um, you're going to laugh at me, but uh, the first few months of me being an FSW, I was actually kind of a little afraid of Joe. Because <laughs> I think probably in the last year, I've probably had like maybe four or five conversations full on with him together I just I never got a read on him and for the longest time like I thought he hated me and if it wasn't for me like watching the matches back and hearing him on commentary every time I would have no idea why I'm still here <laughs> oh Joe uh is is that is that a fair uh analysis uh by uh, Chase uh do, do you give off the intimidating uh, vibe to uh, <laughs> to some of the guys? I don't think so. You know, I'm, I'm a loudmouth uh, New Yorker who states what I believe to be the truth. I try not to sugarcoat anything. I try to tell people exactly what I think, how I feel. And, you know, sometimes people don't want to hear that. You know, so... You know, people would rather go in the back of the locker room with the guys they've been training with who tell them how great they are. Well, you know, the truth of the matter is, well, maybe they've been training for just as long and they haven't got on there. So you're going to have those people that are going to be like, oh, Joe don't like me. Oh, it, it, it's it's never that, that the person's responsibility. You know, we had a guy who was actually uh, moving along pretty well. And Nick came in a little bit after him. And Brett was a little bit before Nick. So those were the three guys that, you know, were kind of uh, around a lot as the younger dudes that were kind of improving. And we thought he was close to have a match at Future Shock. But, you know, the trainers and everybody thinks it's me. And it's like, I have a lot to do with it. But when... Cody and Remy and Sin and, and whoever it is say, hey, I think he's ready, especially on a future shot. We try to give that opportunity. You know, we got a guy, Reese, who's finally, uh, Raw Reese, who's finally getting a little bit of love on there. But if you asked Reese six months ago, he was good to go. Well, the trainer said he wasn't good to go and we didn't utilize him. And I, I could see that he was frustrated and he had to work the front door and, you know, everybody that he was training with, they're getting matches. And, you know, there's a 14 year old kid in Bodie and a 16 year old like Dapion and Dana Lynn, they're getting on shows. And this, this big dude, you know, who, who thinks he has, you know, the most charisma of anybody in the world. The you zaddy. Know, you know, thinks that he's deserving and it was like hey because of his outgoingness and because you know he, he really seemed to want it he's one of the few guys I specifically said hey you know is Reese ready yet you know and I was told he wasn't and then we finally gave him the opportunity we had him work with sin if anybody you know could make sure things are, are kept in place you know, they were uh, quickly getting back to the other guy. His name was Moses and Moses was pretty good. And I remember telling him that at the next future shock, I was going to have him and Brett have a match. Well, Brett already probably had a couple matches and Nick probably had a match or two, but he was bothered that he didn't get matches the way Nick and Brett did. And it was like, but you're getting one in three weeks. And then we never saw him again. And it's like, you know, there's got to be something more than that. It's like, you're ready when you're ready, you know, get, especially when I tell you you're getting the opportunity, well, prove me wrong, go out there and kill it and go out and prove to me that you deserve to have the spot. You know, that's why there's a lot of guys who get 
a 20 second spot, a 40 second spot. They need to do something. The, the more they do well, the more I'm going to utilize them. And I always remember this kid, Lorenzo, you know, he was the strongest dude. I know he was like 160, 170, but he was the laziest motherfucker in the world. You know, like it was time to go get a guardrail and he'd have to walk up to me to ask me about some angle or some story or whatever it was. It was like, dude, talk to me later. Go grab the fucking guardrail. And I remember we did like a a match at Silverton and we had guys like Eli Everfly and a bunch of people on the show. And it was like an eight man tag to start the show. And I was told, you know, his remark was, oh, another throwaway match. It was like, if you're only in the match for two minutes or a minute, make sure you look good in that minute because then I'll utilize you again. But instead, he's squawking and complaining and crying about it. And guess what? He never made it, you know, because the work ethic sucked. Yeah. And I think that's a very, um, a very uh, important thing for anyone who might be listening, who is a young wrestler, whether you're here in Las Vegas or you're anywhere else around the country or the world, is that work ethic, whether it be, uh, you know, ring crew or even asked to, you know, hey, run down to the store and get this, we need this, we need that. That work ethic is reflective in part of your ring work ethic as well and i think a lot of you know a lot of youngsters forget or don't even realize that you're being evaluated 24 7 and i think that's one of the things that i can say about both of you guys um i mean it's very um it's very rare when you can see the respect uh, and nick you're absolutely right, man. Anytime you're not being utilized, you're the first person I see who's right there by Rocky and you have no problem, you know, Hey, what do we need? Or well, he idolizes them. That's why he just wants to, he just wants the the aura of Rocky to hopefully spread to him. Yeah, because, you know, he's an undefeated superstar here at FSW, so he knows he's how to get out. a few wins. Yeah, I know. Two Tell and me out. about it. Tell me about he's it. He's been the midget 10 years ago. <laughs> true, true story. Okay, so so go into that story because I don't know if, if these guys have heard that story. What, what is the, uh, the midget story with Rocky? Let's give Rocky T well, the rub on the podcast. Okay. We had, a, we had a, our commissioner uh, initially, uh, a guy that we knew. He trained over with Rush at the school when Rush had it. Uh, we called him the Big Unit. Name I gave him because, you know, he was small. So he was called the Big Unit. I'm very, I'm very creative that way. <laughs> so now the Big Unit turned heel, and he became the manager for the Vegas Originals, which was Jason Partain and Rush. Well, he was, well, they were feuding, you know, Rocky kind of take, took over as the commissioner. So he kind of feuded. So we put together a six man tag and it was a potpourri. Uh, this other guy used to be a ref and he was the guy who cracked his head open at the very first show we ever did, eliminating himself from a battle Royal by doing a cross body on some other guy who was having his first match. So he eliminated himself. And it was like, why would you even do that? So you eliminated yourself for what reason? And he was like, well, Funny Bone told me. Okay, that that became that story. Well, he was tagging with him. And I forgot who the third person was. But uh, Rocky T ended up, uh, I believe, tasering the big unit and scored the pinfall victory Uh, well he's a big unit after all i mean you know it took goldberg down that taser so it must have took the big unit down with him too you know and and he is the manager of champions he he did take the players club to tag team gold yeah 
Yeah, so hey, maybe Heart and Soul is that's what you guys need. Maybe they have a reunion. Uh, Leon Hader. Uh, Leon Hader and Nino Black's uh, favorite guy, Jason Cash. Jay Cash. <laughs> Nino uh, likes him. <laughs> uh, Joe, as we uh, as we kind of wrap up here, um, let me ask you. Um, when you think of the potential that Heart and Solace has, um, does that really excite you in terms of being able to see that these guys are dedicated, they're hardworking, they're starting to really gel, and that every time that they go out there together, they are improving? Does that really kind of secure your mind that three years down the road let's say that you will still have a very strong tag team division because these guys will now you know be at the level of let's say an unguided three or four years down the road and that there will be guys coming up behind them and if let's say unfortunately if there was God forbid, some kind of injury that puts either one of them out for a while. Do you see a potential of either of them being able to pick up as a singles wrestler for a while while the other is out? First off, I think Nick and Chase definitely have the potential to maybe be the next Brandon G. There's no doubt about that. And secondly, to be honest, I'm not sure how long these guys can get along because Nick is just too nice, and I got to believe Chase is going to be aggravated enough with him one day to just punch him in the mouth. You know, that's what I think. Uh, I don't know about oh. that. I don't know. Chase is the nice guy. That's where the misconception is, is Chase is the nice guy, and I'm the jerk. But roles reverse when we get in the ring somehow. Well, I was talking to one of your opponents, Nico, and he says you're a really nice guy, so... And, and, and Nico is a very nice guy as well. He's one of my yes. favorites. Yes. Hope, to, looking, hope to see him again. Yes, he's looking forward to the rematch. <laughs> now, a rematch I'm looking for, Joe, is the Suavecitos. Me and Chase Bell need that match. So you get that book out and you make it when you have time, all right? Yeah, we're putting stuff together, no doubt. Could, could we possibly see, you know, and then this just comes from the aftermath, could we possibly see Adrian Quest and the Suavecitos against uh, Heart and Solis and Remy Marcel? Oh, I never even thought of that. What a great idea. I might have to implement that at the Halloween show because Adrian Quest can't be there on the 9th. So. Conveniently, he can't be there. So That's right. You know, Bum's going to work for New Japan. The nerve of this guy blowing us off for New Japan. Oh, man. Doesn't he know the aftermath on the ninth? Come on. Uh, obviously not. He probably <laughs> would have, but I, I told him too late. So he probably already accepted the booking and didn't want to let Rocky Romero down because, uh, you know, they needed somebody to wrestle Jordan Clearwater there. So. Oh, man. Uh <laughs> You know, and for any anyone... names, I'm trying to throw out as many names as possible because I haven't mentioned Evan Daniels in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Uh, and and anyone, if you guys are first, if this is your first time tuning into the Defalco Files, if you go back and you follow the journey of the last, um, I think we're at like 75 weeks. What you'll see is a, uh, a wonderful pattern of these names that um, you'll get to know these guys without getting to know these guys. And um, still working on that Evan Daniels uh, interview, yeah. Joe. 75 episodes. I'm never going to get those 100 hours in my life back. <laughs> oh, man. Well, guys, I appreciate you guys uh, coming on. Um, and uh, Joe, I appreciate you uh, grinning and bearing the fact that uh, Nick and Chase were the uh, choice for tonight. Hey, you know, uh, I figured I'd give them the rub. I even gave Lights, Camera, Facts in the rub. So why not these guys? At least they're nicer. Yeah. We know how you feel about those. Those <laughs> mother efforts. You know, other unquote. than Fresco, the rest of them could, like, take a hike. 
Uh, well, um, and and by the way, do, do we know, is Chris Bay okay? I believe Chris Bay is okay. <laughs> oh, man. And, and is that, we're, is we're still that... looking into it, by the way. We have ideas of who it might be. Rikishi being one of them. What's that? Rikishi being one of them. It could be. You know, I heard they did it for The Rock, so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Well, everyone, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, we appreciate you guys. Uh, remember, you can get the FSW Network for uh, just uh, $6.99 a month. Um, also, uh, again, the replay on Fight TV of Survival of the Fittest, $14.99. And uh, is a really solid show. Uh, check that out if you haven't seen it. And again, uh, tune into the Vegas Bad Boys of Podcasting, and uh, make sure you follow Chase and Nick. If you guys give your social media really quick, so uh, fans can start following you guys if uh, they're just getting to know you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Chase. Go ahead. Go ahead, Chase. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, anybody want to find me? You can find me on Instagram at Chase B five zero four. And Facebook at Chase Bell Pro. There it is. All right. I'm on Facebook under Nick Xander, Twitter, Nick Xander YB, and Instagram, Life Under the Scope with two E's at the end. There you go. All right, everyone. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you guys next time.